Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining. My name is Connor Goodwin, and I'm a communications manager at ProPublica. Immigration is a top concern among voters this election year, and today's event is the first in a three-part series examining America's divisive attitudes over immigration. The series will delve into the immigration system, the U.S. economy's reliance on migrant labor, and border enforcement. Today's event, in partnership with the Texas Tribune, will focus on the consequential aftermath of the Trump and Biden administration's shifting immigration policies, particularly around Title 42, an emergency federal code that allowed officials to turn migrants away. Joining me is Perla Treviso, a reporter for the ProPublica Texas Tribune Investigative Initiative. Born in Ciudad Juarez and raised in El Paso, Perla has covered the border and immigration for over a decade. Thanks, Perla. Um, so to start, uh, your most recent investigation is centered around one of the deadliest incidents involving immigra immigrants in Mexico's history, a detention center fire in Ciudad Juarez that claimed the lives of 40 men. The tragedy was wi widely covered when it occurred last year. What made you want to take a closer look? Yes, I had been following the, the shifting policies for, for years and this increasing reliance on Mexico and countries countries further south to stop people from getting to the U.S. in the first place and, you know, wondering what were the consequences of that. When the fire happened, you were hearing a lot about, you know, this is a result of, of U.S. policies, and I really wanted to see how that all played together. So when you put everything on the timeline, when you see the, the warnings in forms of letters or reports, when you see the policies, when you see the results of those policies, what does that picture look like? And so I spent months um, putting together, you know, from, from various documents such as Department of State human rights reports, Congressional Research Service reports, letters that lawmakers were writing to the administration, you know, in, in reports from uh, researchers on both sides of the border, human rights organizations, et cetera. So when you put all of that together, it's clear that the concerns <laughs> of what could potentially happen were widely known. There were concerns about corruption within Mexico's uh, migration system. There were concerns about human rights violations and no one being held accountable. There were concerns about detention center conditions, um, particularly on the Mexican side of the border, crime perpetrated, perpetrated by organized crime, but also by local law enforcement. And so when you put all that together, you do see this buildup um, increasing and the pressure increases in places like Juarez that until Recently, it was a kind of a pass-through city where, you know, migrants would pass through on their way to the U.S. or Mexican deportees would pass through on their way to their to their home states. But it hadn't been a place where where migrants were stranded for long periods of time, and it was not prepared to handle that increased flow. It did not have many shelters. It didn't have as many NGOs. Um, it did not have the infrastructure to hold people. And you kind of see that pressure building and building up as this policies not only remain in place, but also expand. Yeah. And can you, you kind of hinted at it, but can you speak a little bit more to some of the warning signs you uncovered in the course of reporting? Yeah. So, so I think, you know, from, I, you know, I went back over a decade. So I, I think it's important to say that we focus on the period with, with Trump and, and President Biden, but this, this increased enforcement on the South and, and pressure to towards Mexico or relying on Mexico precedes Trump and Biden. You know, even with under Obama, you had this program called Frontera Sur, which increased enforcement, but on, on Mexico, but on the southern side. We focus uh, precisely on Trump and Biden, uh, particularly because for the first time under President Trump, you saw uh, policies that sent people non-Mexican nationals back to Mexico. So you had the, the so-called Remain in Mexico policy first, um, where Mexico agreed for the first time to take people who were not Mexicans, who were being sent back by the US government. So their asylum cases could be processed. Um, and they were, they were asked to wait in Mexico while their asylum cases were processed. And then we saw, as you mentioned, Title 42 with the start of the pandemic that allowed the US government to expel more pe most people to their countries or or to Mexico. And, and so the, the warning signs, you know, start from a decade ago, you see from human rights reports from the State Department, for instance, about concerns and issues happening in Mexico around migrants. And then starting in 2019, you start seeing also um, fires similar to the one that we saw in Juarez, where migrants would live 
mattresses or blankets and fire as a form of protest for regarding like unsanitary conditions and overcrowding conditions in detention centers in Mexico. Um, lawmakers on, on this side, you know, continue to write to the to the administration, including to President Biden. Two months, you know, before the fire, there was a letter that were that they sent out saying we we have serious concerns about the impact that these policies are having. And the Congressional Research Service, two weeks before the fire, um, released a report in which it says that, you know, despite reform efforts, the Mexican Migration Institute retains a reputation for corruption and weak observance of migrant protections. And as a result, migrants remain vulnerable to crime and other abuses and and, and how it, this has placed them at greater risk of harm. Yeah. And then when you wrote to the Biden administration for comment, how did they respond? So when we reach out to the White House and, and the administration, they did not uh, address specific questions to the role uh, the 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 U.S. policies had had or not had on the fire. But they did say that, you know, the detention center was outside the jurisdiction of the United States and pointed to the legal pathways that the administration had created. For instance, um, this includes CB, the use of uh, the CBP-1 app. So basically people who want an opportunity to pretend themselves at a port of entry now can use this mobile application run by the government where there's you know, a number of appointments daily and, and they, they have to try every day until they get one of those appointments. Unfortunately, one of the unintended consequences of this application is that you know it can still take months for people to get one of these appointments in the meantime, they're stranded in places in northern Mexico or, or Mexico City. And so even though the administration pointed to this as a potential solution, it did not acknowledge that some of the migrants, uh, the victims of the fire, were in fact waiting uh, for an appointment to, through this app when they were swept by Mexican authorities, including Stefan, one of the victims of the fire that we uh, sent her the our story. Um, he was he's a migrant from Venezuela. He had been in Juarez um, waiting for for one of the appointments with his sister when uh, Mexican migration authorities picked him up the day of the fire. Um, yeah, and accompanying your story, uh, we also produced a, a short documentary uh, and we have a one minute trailer here uh, that I will play for you in just a second. And while, while you're playing that, the, the documentary actually follows a Venezuelan family who's trying to secure one of the CBP-1 appointments. And, and you can kind of see the, the challenge that they're going through and one, what happens uh, after they manage to secure an appointment. To understand what a city like Ciudad Juarez is like for migrants right now, it all starts with Title 42. It allows the U.S. to expel migrants over public health concerns. Nearly 8 million Venezuelans have fled their country. It amounts to the largest displacement crisis ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere. The right way right now is through the U.S. government's CBP-1 app. Yo no sabía nada de esa aplicación, pero esa responsabilidad que a mí. Uno todos los días está esperanzado de que no se sí caiga así, pero yo siempre tuve esa fe. O tal vez porque mi mamá está de aquí al lado. A veces pasan cosas que, bueno, uno no quisiera que pasaran, pero pasan. No ha migrado tanto y hemos caminado tanto. Llegar uno y estar aguarado no es la idea tampoco. Tantas cosas que uno pasa para venir hasta acá. Ellos ni se lo imaginan. And I will share a link to that uh, doc you can watch on our website shortly. Um, but first, I want to introduce uh, today's panelists. So in the second part of this hour, we're going to invite on a couple experts. Um, Andrew Seeley is president of the Migration Policy Institute, a global nonpartisan institution that seeks to improve immigration and integration policies. His research focuses on mig migration globally, with a special emphasis on immigration policies in the United States. Latin America and the Caribbean. Maureen Meyer is the Vice President for Programs at the Washington Office on Latin America. She has over two decades of experience addressing human rights, U.S. security cooperation, border security, migration and asylum issues, and works closely with various human rights and migrant rights organizations and networks in Latin America. And then Dr. Victor 
Monjerez is the University of Texas at El Paso's Export Control Officer and Director of the Center for Law and Human Behavior. Monjerez previously worked for the U.S. Border Patrol for 22 and a half years and was the Chief Patrol Agent of the Tucson and El Paso sectors. And before I hand it off to Perla, I just want to note that we received more than 100 questions from you all beforehand. We have a very full agenda. Um, but that said, you know, feel free to ask a question at any point, and you can do so by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and typing it there. All right, over to you, Perla. Thank you, Connor. Uh, thank you also uh, to begin with to Maureen, Victor, and Andrew for, for joining us. Um, Maureen, I'm, I'm going to start with you. You know, it's been a year since the fire, um, the Juarez Detention Center that we mentioned before has been permanently shut down. The Mexican government also temporarily shut down uh, 33 other temporary detention centers. Um, there's a criminal trial ongoing, a couple of them. What did this changes tell you? What does it tell you about where we are with the cooperation with, with Mexico and who's held accountable when, when something like this happens? Thanks. Perla, um, and thanks for, for doing so much great work on, on this tragedy. Um, I mean, I think, I wish I could say this is going to be a turning point in how Mexico's Immigration um, Institute, the INM, actually operates um, and, and works to ensure safety for, for the migrants that are in its care. I, I hope that is the case. But you know, as you alluded to earlier, I mean, there is a history, um, very well documented, of abuses against migrants by Mexico's immigration agents. Also a history of really poor detention center conditions that Mexico's Human Rights Commission has documented, including fires. There's a recent report that came out by the organizations representing a lot of the families of the victims and, and the survivors uh, called Don't Let Us Die Here, No Nos Dejan Morir. And you know, they cited 14 fires that occurred in detention centers um, during the administration, including one that led to the death of, of a migrant, um, and the injury of 14 others in Tenosique, so in southern Mexico. So this is not, as you had said, an isolated event. And yet all of those recommendations either went unheeded or were not fully implemented, in, including in, in the Juarez Center, the fire protocol didn't have guidelines on how do you release people, like the priority of you need to make sure people can be rescued. And so it just shows, I think, a history of impunity for a lot of abuses that have occurred against migrants in, in Mexico, but also really a lack of ensuring that anyone that's under the Mexican government's custody is being cared for and that their safety is guaranteed at a minimum at a minimum that you're being held in dignified conditions um, are being abused or you're not gonna be blocked in and, and, and you know die from a fire. And so, you know, this hopefully could lead to change. Mexico's elections are this Sunday. Uh, so we'll see if there's any possibilities there, but I think it also really does highlight the fact that there has been this history of abuse that both governments know about. I mean, um, you had said, and we certainly as an advocacy organization have worked a lot with the State Department, with our Congress on highlighting the really concerns that we have about human rights violations, abuses against migrants in Mexico, and that if the U.S. is asking Mexico to do more, if it's asking it to step up enforcement efforts, or um, in this case, also holding a lot of people that are waiting to, to get to the United States, there are real concerns about how that's happened that the U.S. should take into consideration, and they haven't. And so I think that the thought that you can have a tragedy like this happen, as well as everything else that occurs with migrants mostly waiting to enter the United States, whether that's kidnapping, sexual assault, extortion, and there's no real consequence, shows that both governments aren't really doing what they should to make sure that this is done in a way that at a minimum is making sure people aren't further victimized. A lot of asylum seekers particularly are not further victimized in their attempt to get to the United States. Why do you think you, you mentioned that you know the, the, the U.S., is aware of all of this, but they haven't made changes. Why do you think that this has not led to changes uh, even before the fire or e or even if, if we talk about the fire? I mean, I think you could say both ways. One would be the, Mex the U.S. government. Well, it's Mexico, the sovereign country. We cooperate with Mexico. Um, you know, the, the U.S. has certainly worked to increase training and professionalization of Mexico's police agencies into the Immigration Institute. So we want to, we raise these concerns with Mexico, but they need to, to take the steps. But the other is, um, 
I think the the response that we saw from U.S. officials about the fire, well, migrants should come the right way. Like you should you should make sure there are these tools at their disposal. They should be waiting at the app. They shouldn't be putting their hands into to smugglers. So I think sort of deflecting blame or deflecting responsibility by saying there is a way to do this without looking at the broader context of that can't not everyone is able to access the app. That there are a lot of um, safety concerns regarding how people get. To, to, to the border and that there should be more done. Um, I would say again, on both sides of the border to ensure that the, the system that's set up is where you're working to ensure increased safety for the individuals that are waiting to, to enter the United States. And I think when I spoke with you and other experts for this story, one thing that, that I think several of you repeated is that migrant deaths tend to not lead to policy changes, that numbers lead to policy changes and, and speaking of, of numbers, we've recently seen a, a, a significant drop of border uh, apprehensions or encounters, um, which is it's not common for this time of the year when we see usually the before we get to really hot weather, that's when numbers increase. And part of that is said to be as a result of Mexico's increased enforcement uh, and the cooperation between the Biden administration and the AMLA administration. Victor, can, can you talk to us a little bit about those numbers? What does it tell us that the numbers are uh, decreasing? We saw, you know, the the Del Rio sector at one point was the, the busiest, then that moved to Tucson and then Yuba, and then you had San Diego for a little bit, which hadn't seen numbers like that in decades. So we, we're hearing a lot about numbers and going up or down and Mexico's role in it. Can you tell us from from your experience and from your point of view what 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 does it tell us? Absolutely. When uh, normally when it, you know when you see the numbers, it's a fifty percent drop, right? That's usually a, a great thing, and I would say that that's this, that's pretty significant. Unfortunately, though, we always lose context. You know, we started that fifty percent drops compared to the December. And we had historically large numbers in, in December we saw in terms of arrests along the southwest border. And so even with that drop, and if you continue all the way to the end of the fiscal year for, for uh, the federal government to September 30th, it's estimated that the arrests are going to be around 1.6, between 1.6 to 1.7 million arrests on that. And, and you look, well, that's a big, that's a big drop right from the 2.2 million. Unfortunately, the high water mark was 1.6 million in 2000 for the longest time. Uh, the agency never imagined that the numbers would get even higher in that, because even at 1.6, it was pretty crushing to, to the agency in, in, in 2000. And so when the numbers went up, the the um, in in 2022 and 2023, 2022 <clears throat> of 2.2 2 million, that that's a large number on a daily basis. On that, and you saw the focus point in in you know in the in the real Grand Valley of, of Texas, right? We saw the big uh, on that, and we're starting to see that that shift to some degree to, to other areas. But those numbers are, are again, as a law enforcement perspective, is crushing because it does a number of things. It is when you when when you've got numbers like that, you have to collapse your operations. You have to vacate areas to handle the flows that that, that come in. And the dynamic has changed. The uh, dynamic used to be that most people try to evade apprehension or detection, as opposed to, to now we get people who are seeking asylum. So they come up to different areas um, along the border. You know, we have some famous spots here in El Paso where they know they'll come up and they surrender to claim asylum on that. That, that doesn't take away from the fact that it takes a large number of resources just to try to deal with that number, right? From, from transportation to to the logistics of processing, so, um, um, just it's it's just it's a massive wave of humanity that we have not seen along the border a long time. So if I were to put uh, my border patrol hat back on, right when I was in the agency, is that I, I would here in El Paso, I would look at the, the vast majority of, of our operation would be on patrol, and that becomes the danger uh, of a border that's not managed real well. Why do you think we've seen increases in sectors like you just mentioned El Paso? El Paso for the longest time had not been a busy sector. San Diego had not been a busy sector. What 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 do you think helps explain areas that had not seen that much traffic before all of a sudden become top 
Um, I, I've, I've learned in the last 35 years that perceptions matter, right? The rhetoric that comes from, from our elected officials, what's perceived, what's projected does matter quite, uh, quite, quite a bit. Um, I, I look at the previous administration, for example, on that there was a talk, the, the, you know, the discussion and the talk, right, about the wall, build the wall, build the wall. But if you look at the resources that the uh, uh, U.S. Border Patrol received during that time frame, they weren't all that significant. What was significant was the rhetoric that 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 have come up, and and I would I would venture to guess under the current administration, there's been as much, if not more, resources put into it. But it's perceived that the rhetoric doesn't match on that, and so and then you you couple that with a, a governor in Texas that's been very vocal, very um, up, very public on what he's trying to do. You think tactically, it doesn't make a lot of operational impact, but the perceptions projected though makes it appear very unfriendly and very unwilling, and that's why you're starting to see the the uh, uh, some of the flows. I would love to get some hold of some of the data that they use at CBP when they do the fingerprints of individuals, as opposed to, you know, if they were apprehended before, or were they apprehended? And, and I would uh, uh, guess that the uh, vast majority was in one of the Texas sectors. And, and before I move on uh, to Andrew, we, we do have just want to clarify something. So when you mentioned 1.6 million arrests, they're not really, people are not really being arrested, right? Uh, someone from the audience was asking, um, you know, that they were entering and asking for asylum. So I think one to clarify, when we talk about 1.6 million, we're not talking about necessarily 1.6 million people, but encounters because someone might might be encounter apprehended at the border more than once, right? So I think it, we've seen in the rhetoric sometimes talking about millions of people. So I think it's important to differentiate that the, the data that Border Patrol or CBP shares is its encounters and not necessarily people. But also if you can clarify the, the term arrest uh, and whether people yeah. are actually being arrested or when they present themselves or seeking asylum. So, so when, when, when someone makes an entry, either legal or illegal on that, it's usually, it's an encounter, right? And so what we're seeing right now is people uh, see, uh, seeking asylum, the vast majority on that. And so right now, CBP classifies that as an encounter, which is probably the most appropriate term they, they use on that. Now, when we use the number 1.6 or 2.2 million right, encounters or arrests, doesn't mean that's 2.2 million individuals, right? There might be uh, uh, people that made in, uh, multiple entries, multiple encounters, and so they could be, you know, double counted, uh, uh, counted three times, four times on that. And so uh, that it is not taking into account the recidivism rate that, that, uh, might, that might uh, uh, be part of this population. So Andrew, you know, Vic, Victor was talking about that, right, that when you have large numbers of people come in, even if they're just turning themselves to, to Border Patrol or uh, it still requires resources. And I think we've all seen the images, for example, in Del Rio uh, into 2021 with, with thousands of mostly Haitian migrants. More recently, we saw large groups of people where Border Patrol had to set up basically a, an open uh, processing air kind of tent area um, in Eagle Pass. We, we, we we mentioned C the CBP one app before and the unintended consequences that that has left to some people being stranded. The Mexican side, you're having communities on the US side also dealing with sometimes Border Patrol releasing people to the streets. What what would a more orderly process look like? We're, we're a very long way from that, but uh, that doesn't mean we can't think about what a more orderly process would be and, and you know try and build towards it. So I think the, you know, you, you want really three elements, right? You want people to be able to come on legal pathways, you know, mostly visas, but on some sort of legal pathway to take available jobs. Um, right now we have eight to 10 million jobs a month that are open. It's a, a very tight labor market. So you want some way that, that your visa system adapts, adjusts with the labor market so that people who want to come and take those jobs, who, who often actually already have a job offer, right? I mean, a lot of people who are even coming across the border unauthorized have a job offer, right? So, but you want, you want a way of connecting the employers with the willing workers, right? Um, we don't have that right now. We're very far from that. We have a system that was built in 1990 that has numbers set in stone by Congress in 1990, 34 years ago in a different economy. So that's one element you have to update. Secondly, you need an asylum system 
or actually a refugee system, a protection system where people who are running for their lives, who are, you know, individually persecuted um, or fleeing circumstances that, you know, any normal individual and, you know, you can stretch a little bit what what protection is. And we have in this country um, people who are fleeing uh, things that would put their life at danger can get into the United States, either through asylum, either by applying at the border or ideally earlier, right? Ideally, actually being able to apply for protection closer to where they live, because the saying to people, if you can, you know, hire a smuggler and, and get a few thousand miles, we'll consider your application is not really a great system either, right? So ideally, we want a humanitarian protection system that starts in the region, particularly since we know most people are coming from somewhere in Latin America and the Caribbean, but then has a fail safe at the border. And um, you have to be able to return people who don't meet those two, two characteristics, right? Who aren't coming in on a legal pathway or don't aren't granted asylum. And you have to make decisions on protection fairly quickly, by the way, right? I mean, efficiently within a, a space, because you're not, if it takes four or five years, which is what it takes right now, or most people and sometimes more to get a decision, you're not giving protection to people who need it, who are afraid of being returned. But you're also creating a pull factor for people who might not have otherwise applied for protection. I think in four or five years, they're probably not gonna deport me, and they're right. Right? We don't tend to actually remove a lot of people who've been in the country that long. Um, so the final thing is you have to be able to remove people. And right now we also aren't doing that, right? And, and the reality is people are coming, people are coming for lots of reasons right now. I think the active job market is part of it. Some of the chaos in the hemisphere, particularly some of the, the specific displacement crises in Venezuela and Haiti and Nicaragua, the fact that people are more mobile than ever, that the people are now cross the Darien Gap and that they're able to conceive, you know, voyages from different places, from Central Asia, from parts of Africa, where they would never have thought of coming to the United States before. I mean, those are all a big deal. But but there is also a piece of this, which is policy, which is people know that if they make it to the U.S. border, they are likely to get in. They're likely to get a notice to appear uh, at an immigration facility in the future. They will lodge an asylum claim if they want, and they will be in stasis for many years, right? And that's a system that doesn't make sense for people who need protection, but it also doesn't make sense from, from a migration protection standpoint. And what we've done then as a way of, of trying to stop this, because we haven't resourced any of these things and we haven't actually fixed any of them, is we then turn to Mexico and other countries along the way and say, let's make it harder for people to get here. At least we'll try and throw stones in their road. And what that does is make it much more dangerous for people. We would be much better off with a system that gave protection that had legal pathways, but also returned people. Um, who don't come through those ways, but we've ended up with a system that simply tries to slow people down. Uh, pro, uh, but then, uh, yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, um, Andrew, I think those are great points on that. Um, in fact, uh, when I would host congressional delegations that would come out and talk about what do you need, Chief, there's always resources. And what I've asked was, could you stop treating the border like a singular line on a map? It's an ecosystem. Right. Uh, and the ecosystem has so many variables, and I think you described that very well. So I have two two things, and may for both. But if it's starting with with Andrew, going back. So I think when you when you talk to the administration, or, or when you hear uh, Secretary Mayorkas talk, they they do point to those legal pathways. So right, so they point to the the use of the CBP one app as as one. They use the humanitarian parole, and we won't get into all the details of all of them because that would take. The rest of our hour, uh, but you know, happy to if you want to reach out uh, after and to any of us, and, and we can fill the blanks. But you have the humanitarian parole where people can apply if they're from certain countries to come here. Uh, they you do have more guest worker visas, you know. So they're saying that they 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 are working towards that. And, and you've written about this, you know. I think when we had you here two years ago, uh, last year what has happened right so the administration was moving in that direction what has not and but we have we still seeing record numbers what happened so they they've really stretched the limits of what they can do with the authorities that the executive branch has to try and create legal pathways they, they've tried to include increase employer interest in some of the temporary labor pathways it's increasing in central america it's still a drop in the bucket but it's increasing they created quite a large pathway for cubans haitians venezuelans and nicaraguans um, who are people who can come for two years 
And those are groups of people where there are displacement crises going on in the country. So it made sense to to stretch what they call parole powers, humanitarian parole powers, to allow people to enter the country and have a work permit for two years. But they can't really go much further than that on legal pathways. They've tried to speed up asylum and they've tried to create incentives for people to go to ports of entry to apply for asylum rather than go between ports of entry. Um, but again, without resources, it's really hard to, you, you, without authorities, without Congress, it's hard to create legal pathways. Without resources, you can't really do a lot to, to fix asylum, right? And make it work in an efficient and fair way. And they've tried to remove people, but with the numbers they have, the reality is, you know, the vast majority of people are, are probably getting across right now. And, you know, the a bit with, again, without resources, you know, it is very hard to remove people also. And so none of these things, you know, I, I, I give them credit for effort and for actually understanding that you have to have all those three pieces. But unless Congress gets involved and appropriates money and also provides some authorities, particularly on the legal pathway side, it it becomes very hard to get it done. I mean, we, we saw an attempt by Republicans and Democrats, uh, Senator Langford, Senator Murphy, Senator uh, Cinema, to try and create a very narrow part of this, just dealing with asylum and returns and resources. They didn't touch the legal pathway part, um, which I thought was a, you know, we can quibble on the specifics, but I thought it was at least healthy that they were starting to to move on, on some of the elements on this. I don't think you can make it stick without the legal pathways, but, but uh, yeah, that fell apart. So we're back to where we were. And, and speaking of that, I think it's a perfect segue. And stick with me, Vic, uh, uh, Andrew. Uh, talking about the immigration bills that you know we, we we're hearing a lot about uh, some proposals that have failed. Uh, the, the same bill was just voted on, I think, last week and failed again. Can you walk us a little bit about what that bill would have done? On, on the one hand, uh, on the one hand, you have the administration and and person and personally President Biden saying we should pass this bipartisan measure is the strongest measure that we've considered in a long time. On the other hand, you have um, some advocates saying that this would really curtail the, the right to asylum and, and it's not moving in the right direction, would do very little to actually solve the problem. Can you walk our, our viewers and uh, assess to what we're talking about and what that would have meant? I, I think in, in very brief terms, we're we're talking about it would have codified some of the things they did to restrict asylum, to make it a higher standard for asylum if you cross between ports of entry. That's already there through an executive order, but it's a little cumbersome the way it's set up in the executive order. So it has streamlined it. It would have put a lot of money into asylum officers and decision making on asylum and, and judges as well for decisions on asylum. It would have put more money into the Border Patrol and into ICE. Um, both for processing people and ICE for returns. Um, but it is, you know, it, it, it's something of a Band-Aid, but it's an important Band-Aid. Sometimes Band-Aids are important too, right? I mean, it, it would have at least created a more virtuous cycle for people who have strong asylum claims to present themselves at the border and a disincentive for people who who know they don't have strong claims. But it again, it's without resources, none of this this really matters, by the way. Um, the flip side, let me say also while we're on, I mean, Mexico actually came out, I think it's worth saying, Mexico came out for the first time ever with a, a national strategy on migration last week. Um, I, it is actually, I mean, I, again, great plaudits for doing it because I think it's something that's needed to be done for a long time. How does Mexico relate to its own diaspora? The, you know, 12 million Mexicans that live in the U.S., how does Mexico deal with irregular migration? How does Mexico deal with asylum seekers in Mexico? And how do they deal with people that want to stay in Mexico and people they want to attract? Very good stuff. Again, like with the U.S., it's a question also of resources and authorities and how you actually do it. But, you know, I want to give them credit, both, both sides actually credit for for having some good ideas, but but acknowledge also that that on the ground, the actual results aren't necessarily what what we'd hope they were. And speaking of, of resources, and I'll, I'll go to you on this, Victor, you know, I think when, when we talk about resources, the, the budget for the Border Patrol and for CBP has been going up considerably, right? And I think uh, from from some of the experts I've spoken to, they 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 talk about the need of more resources, for example, for the immigration courts to address the huge backlog for asylum officers to process these cases, for uh, customs officials at the ports of entry to process people who are coming in through those legal pathways. When you mentioned uh, you know resources, Victor, can you talk about your your take from from your uh, from the point of view from when you were a border patrol agent or when you were in charge and your research 
in your view, would this bill have addressed uh, some of the issues that you have? And I'll just point out that at least the first time around, it was supported by the Border Patrol Union. Well, you know, when we, we speak about resources on that, usually it's it's a wonderful, you know, a wonderful term for government entities, right? To say, hey, we'll give you additional resources and always wants well, to be personnel uh, on that. But the, the, the problem comes up, though, is when we do that, we treat what's happening on the border, again, like a singular line on a map uh, on that. And we forget that it's much deeper than that. And so when they would ask me in Tucson, for example, Chief, do you want more Border Patrol agents? How many more could you use? Well, I had 4,500 Border Patrol agents, which was larger than the agency when I joined nationwide. And he goes, it wasn't those resources. It's look, if, if you give me more Border Patrol agents, we will make more arrests which will have a logistical tail from the U.S. Marshals, the Bureau of Presidents, the court system, the immigration court system. Uh, and I go, let's start looking at funding other entities to, to be able to do this. So, so resources are not always, let me give you border patrol agents, right? On, on that, there's always gonna be a baseline need. And you're absolutely right that the agency's grown significantly. Uh, but when I got in, in, the, in the border patrol, you know, in the late eighties, there were 4,000 agents nationwide. When, when I retired from Tucson, there were I had 4,500 agents alone in Tucson. So, so we're such, an, such a deep hole. They've been trying to dig themselves out, right? Just to get to a place where you can say, look, we can have under certain numbers, a certain semblance of situational awareness of what's occurring. To be able to react, do a, a proper disposition of all the encounters on that. And so resources, I read the bill, talked about, you know, additional more patrol agents. And, and, and you, you know, if I was a sitting chief, I'd say, how about additional immigration judges? How about initial, uh, initial processes to help that flow, right? To be able to adjudicate that quickly. And, 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 because one thing is going to happen when you're able to adjudicate these cases rather quickly, quickly and fairly is the flow either is going to increase or it's going to, it's going to slow down. And, my, and, and I estimate that it'll start to slow down, understanding that there's now a pathway, right? A pathway that now sounds, I won't say reasonable, but they, they realize, hey, it's, it's within our horizon to be able to do. And, and so, and that includes policy as well. Again, you know, policy has a big impact on what that ecosystem should look like on that. Uh, but, you know, as long as we get a big marker and, and kind of rub down on the, on the border, I think uh, this will just continue to repeat itself over and over. All right, um, we've, we had several participants being asked about executive action. And, and I think just recently there's been some reports that uh, following the, the failure to pass of the, the bill that we had just been discussing, President Biden was considering some executive action around this issue. Could you give us a, a brief overview of what sort of executive actions President Biden has taken and is currently considering? And you know, can he do more as, as some on on the right um, are calling for, or even um, some on the I mean, left as well. <laughs> I think a lot of it's already been touched on by by Andrew. And actually, if you look at executive actions or orders on migration, even during Biden's first year in office, there were almost three hundred. So we can't, you know, like cover all of them. But I think some of the bigger ones, which which Andrew also you know mentioned, there was the the Remain in Mexico, the migrant protection protocols um, that was. Uh, attempted to be canceled the first month of Biden's administration, but then went through lawsuits and was finally and able to end during after a Supreme Court resolution in June 2022. So therefore, you couldn't be sending asylum seekers back to Mexico to wait for their immigration hearings in the United States. And there's also, I said, Title 42, which was allowing um, Mexicans and not me non-Mexicans to be expelled back to, to Mexico without any you know, pathway to to a hearing in the United States, but some of the other bigger ones, and Andrew mentioned these, you know, the parole program. So you have the ability with the humanitarian parole to have over 360,000 people enter the United States every year if they have a U.S.-based sponsor and a valid passport, and they're coming from you know, Haiti, but, uh, Haiti, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela. So just those four nationalities. And so I think a lot of the, the programs have been in general, looking at who's coming right now, like what are the top nationalities of the people and also where it's very hard for the administration to send people back. I mean, Venezuela would be where there's no diplomatic relations right now, both 
Nicaragua and Cuba are very limited in how many deportation flights they have, and clearly Haiti, which the administration has, I think, um, shockingly sent over 20-some thousand Haitians back to a country that currently does not have a functioning government. Um, but you, So you have a lot of limitations also, and I guess I wanted to flag the challenge with a lot of these and, and what, you know, Andrew was talking about of the current legal pathways, is they're really nationality based a lot of times and not based on need. And so when you look at the number of who's coming into the border, which includes Mexico, still right now is the top nationality. It's certainly dramatically different than maybe a decade ago, but you still have 25% or more of the people crossing are, are Mexicans. A lot of those are fleeing violence and persecution too, right? So you have programs that are for certain nationalities and exclude others that might also benefit from expanded legal pathways, or they can't afford to wait, too. I mean, if you're in Mexico, you're not really, if you're fleeing the country that you're persecuted and you'd like to be able to enter the United States um, as quickly as, as you can. Um, and I think I wanted to flag two things. One, the important, the limits that the administration has, which you know both Victor and Andrew have alluded to in terms of resources, and not just resources at the border, but then resources for the entire immigration system, especially to go through the asylum backlog. And so that's something that Congress needs to move forward with, just like Congress would need to move forward with any immigration reform that would have legalization for any of the, the broader population that is here. But the other, I think, recognizing the, the limits and what the Biden administration has been able to do on legal pathways, they've also tried to have a much more regional approach to migration, um, recognizing not everybody wants to come to the United States or should. And so I think um, if you look at the, the assistance that has been given to Latin American countries, over $2.4 billion in assistance, a lot looking at supporting countries' asylum systems, support for refugees, or um, as Andrew knows well, the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection, which was signed by 22 governments at the Summit of the Americas in, held in Los Angeles in 2022. It was a real effort by the administration to look at this from, this is a regional issue. There are commitments a lot of governments need to take on in the region, both in terms of expanding their own legal pathways as well as humanitarian protection. And that it's also a way to look at not just the U.S. as the only destination country. I think it's worth flagging that, that Colombia has 2.9 Venezuelans at least living in a country that has 52 million people population wise. So it's not just a, a challenge the United States is grappling with. And I think the administration has recognized given its own limits, trying to really encourage other countries. I think the flip side is also push them and push them more on enforcement and other measures that are, as Andrew said, working to slow down how people get here and oftentimes requiring them or forcing them to take more dangerous routes. I think, you know, for, I don't know if, if, if Andrew and, and Victor want to take this or, or one of you, but I, we, we've been hearing a lot about a crisis, right? And, and either Biden's crisis, the border crisis, on the one hand, we're being invaded. On the other hand, nothing's going on. Um, we've had a lot of people who reach out to us saying, you know, is there a crisis or is there not a crisis? And what does that entail? So, you know, let, let's start maybe with you, Victor, from a more law enforcement perspective. Is, is there really a crisis and what, what do we mean by that? And, and I'll just quickly say that you actually recently hosted a uh, former Vice President Pence in El Paso, who was there also for a panel discussion on this issue. So we know it's it's top of mind for a lot of people. What's your take? You know, if, uh, um, if I had a Border Patrol hat on right now, I'd go retire. Right. Just just because of, of, of the the volume. When you look from the law enforcement perspective and what you're trying to do is, is it really it comes out to risk mitigation when it comes down to it, is reducing the risk of, of the unknown coming in and not knowing where they're going on that. And you can't do that right now. You can't do that with, with the large numbers, but what I would consider chaos and, and clutter. And so when, I, when I'm when asked that question, I go, is this a crisis? And it is, it is a crisis in terms of what a law enforcement on the border, pass a deal. And, and really what they have to do is detect that entry, identify and classify that, respond and resolve it. Um, and so when you have people who are seeking asylum, who are given up, right? So we have a good identity of who they are. It's when you have to collapse, collapse your operations and give up miles and miles of area you can control, that's where the real risk comes up. 
uh, then that becomes a real uh, uh, real danger. So it isn't the encounters that would worry me as much. It's the areas that I couldn't get to in the unknown, right? What we would refer to as known getaways at, at, at that time. So yeah, yes, ma'am, I, I would definitely call this a crisis. Andrew, your thoughts? I mean, I think the American public overwhelmingly thinks it's a crisis, right? I mean, it, it is, if you look at polls, there are at least four that came out recently that all tell us exactly the same story, which is that Americans are, are quite pro-immigration. They actually think immigration is good for the country. It's gone down a little bit, but it's still pretty high. We're actually one of the countries in the world where, where the vast majority of people actually think immigration is a good thing. Actually, a lot of people are immigrants, children of immigrants, spouses of immigrants, you know, that the, it, immigration is part of who we are. It's part of our DNA. There, yes, there are a few people who hate immigrants out there, but the vast majority of Americans actually think immigration is a good thing. But they're also really worried about the border, right? And this cuts across party lines now. This is not just a, yeah, yes, there's a partisan divide. Republicans are more concerned about the border than Democrats, but Democrats have moved on this issue as of independence. And I think when you have a system that can't make distinctions about who should come into the country, um, that undermines the credibility of your immigration system. And it then makes people much more worried about about immigration in general, much more, much less willing to support things like legal pathways that would actually help. Um, is it a crisis in the sense of, you know, I say it's sort of like North Korean nukes. I mean, it's not, it's not going to destroy our country. You know, we, we do a lot of research on how immigrants are doing in the U.S. and it turns out they're doing really well. Um, children of immigrants are, in fact, almost all the labor force growth in the United States, in fact, all of it right now is either from immigrants or their children. Children of immigrants are doing incredibly well in school. You know, we don't have a crisis in terms of our well-being as a society, but we do have a crisis in terms of, of being able to make decisions about who comes in and keep some sort of control of our immigration policy. And I'm, I'm worried if we don't figure this part out and be able to, to to be able to say that, you know, most people, sure, some people always slip through the cracks, but most people are coming in through an orderly process, right? People care about order. So, you know, through an orderly process, we've decided they need protection. They've come with a visa or other, other legal way of coming in or they're getting returned, but this is the process. Or we've brought them from somewhere else because they have someone that can sponsor them, like the CHNB program, or they're a refugee that's being resettled. I mean, you know, people are coming in through a predictable way. Unless we can say that most people are coming that way, what we're going to see in this country is a backlash against immigration in general that will will hurt all of us, not just immigrants. It'll hurt it'll hurt our economy as well. And isn't it that? Go go ahead, Mark. Sorry, Perla. I mean, I just think it's important to add that in in all of this, and I think as the administration looks at how do you, you know, reduce the numbers at the border so that it doesn't seem like it's a crisis. What you end up having is a crisis, a humanitarian crisis on the Mexican side of the border, too, that I think is really important to, to sort of focus on. The fact that as numbers have dropped here, especially since last December, I mean, Mexico is encountering over 120,000 migrants a month right now in Mexico and seems to be mostly busing them around the country to keep them away from the border. And so what you have is, is a, a crisis that you're sort of exporting farther south. And, and so where you see Mexico City having a huge housing challenge for the number of asylum seekers that are waiting there for CBP one appointment or to, they already have an appointment and they're just waiting for their, their turn. But especially in Northern Mexico where you have thousands of people waiting. And so that really taxes resources there. It puts them at risk. And I think we could say the flip side in the United States when you have thousands of people coming into local communities without having a federal coordinated response with state and local governments about what types of resources you need, then you have images that that do look more like a crisis, people sleeping in bus stations or plane or airports, instead of really dedicating the resources so that those people can quickly you know, settle into communities that they can get work permits and then they can you know have a, a more contribution to the communities where they're living instead of feeling like you're sort of becoming a burden. I do want to quickly move to the elections before we run out of time, but just to to clarify and correct me, uh, any of you can correct me if I'm wrong, people, when they turn themselves into Border Patrol or come through the port of entry, do go through a background check before they're being released, right? So at least in terms of the people who are turning themselves in would go through some sort of check before being released into the U.S. to continue their cases? limited one. Victor, you probably know this better than me. I mean, there's a very cursory background check to see if there are any hits in, you know, in in criminal databases, if they have outstanding deportation orders. It's it's not a very 
I mean, simply because the processing time isn't available, right? People are being processed at a with very few. And, and I like Victor's point about the ecosystem. I mean, you know, th there is sort of an ecosystem that's strained overall. It's not just, I mean, it's, it's the border patrol. It's the, the what's called the OFO agents, the, the people at the ports of entry. They're, you know, it's everyone. It's the asylum system. It's the judges and the immigration courts. The whole thing is stretched, but the processing times are so fast. I My understanding is there is a, a basic background check, but it, it's not a, an extensive one. And, and that, that's correct, Andrew. It's, it, it's not extensive. You know, it's a reliance when people come in, right? Part of the booking information, fingerprints, stuff like that. They run into databases. Um, they rely on most individuals will toss their IDs and stuff of that nature. So you take their name, you take the name and date of birth, uh, face value, you run those. Um, they don't come up with anything in most cases uh, uh, on that. And so the ones that really kind of pop up on a, on a check may be either a prior administrative action, could have been deportation, it could have been something of that nature, or someone that might have entered previously in the United States and had a criminal record in the United States, be it, you know, really low, very high, and they've returned on that. So I, I would not put a heavy reliance on, on those type of uh, uh, checks at this point. Again, just, we just haven't had a lot of incidents. I mean, there haven't been a lot, there haven't been incidents of terrorists getting across, right? So the other side, I mean, it's not that, you know, all chaos is breaking loose and, you know, so far it's been manageable, but is it the way you'd want to run the railroad? Is it the, you know, is it sort of, can you actually say with confidence, you know, we're, we're checking everyone in a detailed way? Not really. Maureen, sorry. I think, no, no. Yeah. So, so, you know, we, we are approaching the election, uh, immigration as, as we have mentioned is a top issue for, for voters. On the one hand, um, you have President Biden pushing for this sort of bill. Some would say that he has heartened his position on immigration a bit. On the other hand, you have Trump saying that he would call for mass deportations, potential return to the so-called Remain in Mexico policy. And I'll, I'll start with, with you, Maureen. What, you know, heading into to November and, and past the election, what do you expect to see around immigration? Um, well, I think... In terms of the Biden administration, what we will continue to see a, a harder line policy. I mean, I think to have Biden come out maybe February of this year, I will shut down the border. Um, if you give me that authority, is a very you know significant shift from when he he took office. Um, looking at immigration reform and, and a much more welcoming stance, in part because the numbers have you know, gotten so high, and I think a lot of the management challenges that have been alluded to here. So I think between now and the elections, we will likely see one ongoing work and pressure with Mexico on this. Presidents Biden and Lopez Obrador spoke a few weeks ago and really talked about how they're going to increase enforcement to reduce the number of migrants reaching the border. So real pressure on Mexico. Again, Mexico's elections are this Sunday. I'm sure we will expect conversations right after of what is the president-elect who takes office in October? What is her stance, likely the two leading candidates are women, going to be in cooperating with the United States? And Andrew can talk more about how their policies might shift or not uh, with with uh, the new president, but I think pressure on Mexico and farther north or south, excuse me. There was a, a migration meeting in Guatemala on May eighth, May 9th, Also looking at some of the regional protections, but also border security, increasing visa restrictions. So looking farther south to reduce the numbers while they are trying to expand. Some of these legal pathways. There's these safe mobility offices in Colombia, Ecuador, Costa Rica, and Guatemala that are meant precisely to process people for refugee resettlement or other legal pathways to try to reduce the number of people coming here. Post elections, I think we hopefully, if you know, if it is a Biden second term, see a more um, shift back to expanding legal pathways, improving the system, adding more resources. Uh, addressing a lot of the shortcomings that we're seeing now, I think, and a continuation of these programs, especially the regional programs. I think with uh, Trump second term, we saw the first term, you know, canceling refugee resettlement numbers or dramatically lowering them, canceling programs that Biden restarted, like the Central America's Miners Parole Program, to building more wall, to, as you said, increased mass deportation. So I think it's almost, it's a very contrasting view of, of the situation at the border and, and in terms of the contributions migrants make to uh, the United States or what to how to address the undocumented population here. 
uh, that will have stark differences come January 2025, depending on uh, the results of the elections. Andrew, Victor, any quick thing? I know we're running out of time and this might not be fair to either of you. Any quick additions to what Maureen just said? I would just say that we tend to treat this as a political football and either, you know, you want immigrants or you don't. And and the reality, the American public is much more nuanced. The American public wants immigrants, but they also want to know how they're coming into the country. They want to know there's a legal process and they would behoove both parties to figure out, you know, Democrats tend to err on the side of not worrying about the the control side, Republicans, you know, overshoot on the other side of, of trying to shut it all down. But it, the American public's really in the middle of both of those, right? And and I think actually most Republicans and Democrats are in the middle of in the middle of that. They're not where the extremes are. They want to see they want to see robust immigration. They know the country needs it, but they also want to know that there is a system that that actually can make a decision about who comes in and and can justify that decision. And we're not there right now. And, you know, the alternative tends to be, well, we can't figure it out ourselves. We then go back and, and push Mexico and other countries to do it for us. And we end up with things like in Sierra Juarez. Uh, Pearl, real quick, what I think is really dynamic and interesting this time around, maybe in the last 35 years, is that now you have middle America really vested in this issue. On that, I, I would venture to guess in the last 35 years or so, um, it's been really considered a fourth state border problem. And now that you see delegations from other parts of the country really interested in this. So I think that I think that's a twist that's very interesting.